Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those who uh, don't know me, uh, I'm Joseph Altschuler, assistant professor here at the Illinois School of Architecture and chair of the Lecture and Exhibition Committee. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Our curated series this semester is entitled Advocates Advocate. Architectural training empowers us to do so much more than design buildings. In what ways might architectural advocates advocate with and for communities? How can architects, designers, and planners advance public policy and the vitality of the public realm? What does civically engaged design look like in 2023? And in what new ways might designers impact contemporary public spaces? To what extent can architectural thinking and practice expand our collective capacities for empathy and justice? This series invites multiple voices to respond to the role of design advocacy in their work and to reflect on their role in engaging with the publicness of the built environment. Tonight's lecture will be moderated by PhD student Tai Wakabayashi and introduced by our librarian, our amazing librarian, Emily Matthews. Uh, Tai Wakabayashi is a second year PhD student in the Department of Landscape Architecture uh, with an MArc and a bachelor's in English. He also serves as a research assistant for the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory using post-structuralism and new materialism. His research uncovers intersubjectivities between humans and radioactive materials, aiming to theorize morphologies of nuclear landscapes. Last week, alongside his cohort mates Stephen Ferroni and Ian Sorsenel, uh, the PhD cohort organized a reading group dedicated to Dr. Lisa Yunlin's scholarship and Ty will serve as moderator of the discussion following the lecture. Uh, Emily Matthews is the head librarian at the Ricker Library of Architecture and Art. One of Emily's recent projects at the Ricker is the Decentering the Canon initiative in the Architectural Library. The library collects materials that have filtered through such canonizing forces as higher education and the publishing ecosystem. Can the library broaden the canon or does it merely reinforce it? Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Ricker Library, which we're very thankful for, and it's my pleasure now to welcome Emily to introduce our guest speaker. All right. Here I am, here we go. Let's meet, welcome Lisa Yunli, who has a BA at, from Bryn Mawr College and a PhD from Duke University, and she is the Executive Director of the National Public Housing Museum a cultural activist, an associate professor of public culture and museum studies in the UIC School of Art and Art History, and teaching faculty with the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Education Project at Stateville Prison. Lisa is working with public housing residents to open a museum in the last remaining building of the historic Jane Addams homes, with a mission to preserve, interpret, and propel housing as a human right. The museum will include the world's largest collection of oral histories of people who grew up in public housing, three restored apartments from several different generations of diverse public housing families, storytelling spaces to bridge the arts of innovative public policy, an entrepreneurship hub that includes a social justice cooperative and museum store owned in partnership with public housing residents and contemporary art spaces. As the previous director of the Jane Addams Old House Museum, she oversaw a renovation of one of the United States' most important historic sites, installed a new permanent exhibition, and reinvigorated public programming. As the director of the UIC School of Art and Art History from 2010 to 2017, she helped to found a museum and exhibition studies program that is committed to social justice. Lisa served on both Mayor Brandon Johnson and Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Art and Culture Transition Teams and on Mayor Lightfoot's Commission for Monuments, Memorials, and Historical Reckoning. She was recently reappointed by Governor Pritzker to the Board of the Illinois State Museum and serves on the boards of Three Arts and the Field Foundation. Now, on a personal note, I am especially pleased to sponsor and also introduce Dr. Lee's work. As a proponent of information and documentation, from an activist position and the art history, right? So, libraries are closely connected to museums and archives, and as fellow institutions dedicated to preserving and providing access to culture, which is a public good. All too often, what has been preserved and provided access to 
does not tell a full or accurate picture and not broad representation of lived experiences beyond the most privileged. I'm so excited to hear Dr. Lee's talk and be inspired to change the ways that we collect, keep, and display materials for the broader good. So let's welcome. <laughs> citizen of the Potawatomi people, Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable, who lived there with his wife, Kitty Hawa, who was a Potawatomi woman, whom he married in 1770. When Kitty Hawa was displaced from her home by the U.S. government through a series of forced displacements of approximately 60,000 Native Americans, de Sable followed her and his two children to Iowa. And when the National Public Housing Museum opens in our permanent site, in the last remaining building of the Jane Addams homes, we will be joined in building, we will be located in a building where many families were also displaced during the plan for transformation in an effort to address segregation, crumbling buildings, and racialized poverty. One of the first actions of the plan was the bulldozing of 11 public housing developments that when demolished represented the largest net loss of affordable housing in the history of the United States. Our mission at the National Public Housing Museum is to fight for the right for all people to a place to call home. And it's incredibly prescient um, in this you know, last two weeks, um, remembering stories of displacement and finding ways to honor their histories doesn't change the past, but an understanding of the places we live, where we love, and where we work, and the ongoing consequences of this past can empower us to create a better future for us all. And finding new ways to build solidarity to fight past injustice in order to build a better and more collective future is part of the work that we are committed to at the museum. <laughs> So the museum very much believes in the power of place and memory and the importance of creative placekeeping. So across the street from the museum is the Scafuri Bakery, which is a family-owned business that has been there since 1904. And when Luigi Scafuri immigrated from Calabria, he opened a business that was much more than just a store. They allowed women to bring their yeasted breads to rise when there was no heat and handed out free loaves of bread during the Depression. They were an important community site. And Scafori Bakery um, was opened and maintained for many years by Annette, and her great-granddaughter Kelly, dressed as a donut now, is the manager. 
And so um, I brought some of those Kafori cookies that are outside on the table with the sandwiches. And I hope that you'll savor them and think about these are the same cookies, the same recipes that the public housing residents I'll be talking about eight, 75 years ago. <laughs> My talk today is called Demand the Impossible. This is a phrase attributed to Che Guevara from a speech he gave that opens, be realistic, demand the impossible. But for me, this phrase also resonates with the pragmatism of Jane Addams. This may be the first time and last time that Jane and Che share a slide, so like you guys should know it. Um, Jane Addams was the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize and the namesake of the National Public Housing Museum's building. Adams had a robust and capacious notion of pragmatism, not the shallow notion that we often use today as an excuse when we say things like, oh, that's not pragmatic, meaning that could never be possible. For Adams, pragmatism was the practice of theories which would yield experiences and knowledge that could then inform new theories and analysis. In this way, one was always unleashing one's imagination to demand the impossible, but always grounded in that which was real and in the material. So for today's talk, I'm going to share some of the ways that I have been working to reinterpret the largest artifact in our collection, the last remaining building of the Jane Addams homes on the near west side of Chicago, to tell you some of the things we are making possible and how we have gone from this <coughs> where people would say, who the hell is going to go to a public housing museum, to this, where now the Pulitzer Foundation and other places are calling us the future of museums, and also to this, where we now have a partnership with CHA and Midwest so that our museum campus and building also includes 15 units of mixed income housing in the back of the building. At one point, the Jane Addams homes consisted of 987 units across 32 buildings and 52 row houses. John Holliver, one of our nation's most respected architects, headed a team that designed the complex as a demonstration project to showcase visionary public housing ideas. And throughout its history, until 2002, the buildings provided convivial homes for tens of thousands of multiracial working class residents. When the Jane Addams Homes was slated for demolition as part of the plan for transformation launched by the Chicago Housing Authority, dilapidated infrastructure from deferred and lack of maintenance, escalating violence from gangs and police acting with impunity, the lack of neighborhood investments in critical social services such as public schools and public health and widespread corruption all contributed to serious problems that needed to be addressed. It got to be so terrible that the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, seized control of the Chicago Housing Authority in 1995 in one of the federal government's highest profile efforts to salvage a failing system of public housing. The CHA brokered a deal with the HUD to reestablish local control in exchange for a vow that Chicago would radically change its approach to public housing. The plan for transformation, which was called, um, was a massive $1.6 billion budget funded in part by the federal government's Hope 6 program, an acronym for Home Ownership Opportunities for People Everywhere. And the plan's stated aims included tearing down dilapidated buildings, renovating a few others, and strengthening communities by integrating public housing and its leaseholders into the larger social, economic, and physical fabric of Chicago. Many advocates saw demolishing decrepit and dangerous housing stock in Chicago and replacing it with new mixed income homes is not only necessary, but also an opportunity to encourage racial and class integration in Chicago, one of the most highly segregated cities in the United States. For others, however, the plan, which sought to demolish 25,000 units of housing and 11 high-rise public housing developments, displacing thousands of families without any guarantee of an affordable replacement, seemed to extend the intentional neglect and organized abandonment of the city's most vulnerable citizens. And for many, this was sadly another iteration of how James Baldwin described it. 
16 and then Francisco told me on television. Thank God we got him to talk. Maybe somebody will start to listen. He said, I got no country, I got no flag. He's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house. Because the San Francisco is engaging as all most of the cities now are engaged in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Yet it, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, 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 is an accomplice to this fact. Now this, we're talking about human beings. There's not such a thing as a monolithic wall or you know, some abstraction called Negro problem. These Negro boys and girls who at 16 and 17 don't believe the company means anything that it says, don't feel they have any place here on the basis of the performance of the entire country. No, I certainly could not say that you're exaggerating. While the city has replaced some of those units, activists and advocates are engaged in debates about how to hold the city accountable for the units that have not been replaced. The land that remains undeveloped for housing and sold for other purposes. And since the launch of the plan for Chicago, a plan um, for transformation, Chicago has seen one of the biggest migrations of African Americans since the Great Migration, but this time out of Chicago, in this reverse Great Migration. Many are choosing to leave for the warmth of the actual sun in the South, but also due to the lack of public and affordable housing in our city. Experts from the Urban Institute predict that by 2030, Chicago's African American population will shrink to 650,000 from the post-war high of only 1.2 million, which will have far-reaching political, social, economic, and cultural impacts for all of our lives. It is within this context of the on-the-ground activism to stop the demolition, public housing residents profoundly understood the power of place and demanded a museum that would serve as a visible reminder of the history of public housing. That they imagined a cultural institution that could also be a site of resistance against erasure and forgetting. They felt that there was an important role for a museum in the struggle for self-determination. Here is Ms. Devere Beverly, who was a Chicago commissioner of housing and a lifelong public housing resident, and she helped to organize a broad coalition of residents and preservationists, activists, and organizers for a museum. Ms. Devere served for several decades as the president of the Community Advisory Council, the CAC, the system of self-governance of resident control that tenants fought for and established so that they would be empowered to make decisions about their everyday lives and their living conditions. One of the other great heroes of this project is our board chair currently, Sunny Fisher. She was the executive director of the Driehaus Foundation and a leading preservationist in Illinois, and she immediately understood the potential of the museum. In addition to her work as a champion for women for arts and culture and a longtime fierce social justice advocate, Sunny also grew up in public housing in the Bronx. Here she is with her brother and her sister, and she often heard people say, you grew up in public housing? You're Jewish. And so she knew that there was one mainstream narrative that needed to be changed and needed to be more inclusive about public housing residents. Sunny helped us secure some of our first major sources of creative and financial support and connected the museum to a broad network of like-minded institutions, like the Tenement Museum in New York City and Ruth Abram, its founder, who was also an early consultant of the museum. Ruth is also the founder of an international coalition of Sites of Conscience, an organization to which the museum currently belongs. District 6 Museum in South Africa, the Gulag Museum, and the Tenement Museum, these are all historic sites who are committed to a methodology of, by, of preserving history by making it relevant to the most critical social struggles today and also insisting that we cannot solve the biggest problems facing us without becoming astute students of history. We fervently believe that we need to go upstream to solve problems, and upstream for a history museum means going back in time and asking questions like, how did it get this way? But also, how might it be otherwise? In this way, history museums have less to do with the past than with making sure that we have a future worth living. Um, this afternoon at lunch, I had the joy of having a meal with Nikita Thomas, who's 
doing really amazing projects here um, around super graphics. So people should like check that out. And I promised her that I was going to add a kind of section because we were talking about this idea of time. And it reminded me of a recent opera that I saw that is written by Esperanza Spalding and Wayne Shorter. And it's a retelling of the story of Iphigenia. And in the first act, Greek soldiers sacrifice five separate Iphigenias. But then in Act Two, the myth pauses and the previously sacrificed Iphigenias come together and start to share their stories with the not yet sacrificed Iphigenia, the sixth Iphigenia, and in order for her to write a new ending. And she is called Iphigenia of the Open Tents. And it, the Greek choir starts to sing over and over again, open tense, open tense, open tense, arguing that the current sort of grammatical construct in our notion of past, present, and future tense doesn't adequately encompass sort of the ideas of moral accountability, of agency, of full historical reckoning and understanding, and agency for us to change also our futures by understanding the past. What we need is instead is an open tense. And so this sort of idea, I think, infuses a lot of what I'm talking about, of like what it means to do work in a historic site and where you're not so grounded in the past that you don't have your eye on the future and you're also paying very close attention to what's happening on the ground in the context. And so I think that's Oh, really, I love this idea of an open tense, and there's so many, I think, really cool, interesting. Alison Rollins is a poet who's working in the open tense now, and I think it's a really cool thing to be looking into. So, um, when I actually talk about public housing, um, you know, sort of, I was the director of the Jane Addams Hull House Museum, and uh, in 27, and they were, Back then, Sonny Fisher and the residents came to me and said, can you help us open a museum? And so I was the first board member of the museum. And then in 2017, um, I helped to wrangle the building from HUD, which transferred the 47,000 square foot building to us with a land lease from the CHA for $1. And just this past year, with the help of many donors and fellow dreamers, we are now fully under construction. Yay! <laughs> over to us on April 15th and we'll have two months of installation of exhibits that I am like furiously writing labels for and will be open at the end of uh, June. So when I say their names, Robert Taylor Holmes, Dearborn Holmes, Jane Addams Holmes, Harold Ickes, Stately Gardens, Grace Abbott, Henry Horner Holmes, Randolph Towers, Loomis Courts, Cabrini Green, just the names of the projects often conjure feelings and thoughts in the popular imagination. But people do not think of kids like Bobby and Marion Fumo, who are among the first residents of the Jane Addams homes, nor do they imagine vibrant communities that live there, nor do they think of black joy and resilience, nor of the people who formed imaginative and complex networks of support and long-lasting friendships, Usually the names of the projects only conjure stereotypes. Due to a long and deeply racialized history, public housing and the people who live there have been regarded with deep suspicion and resentment. More than 40 years ago at a campaign rally, Ronald Reagan introduced the term welfare queen into the public conversation about poverty, and this pernicious caricature has persisted. The notion of someone living large and benefiting from government handouts has frequently eclipsed the glaring reality of actual families deeply in need of support, living in poverty due to both misfortune and the injustices of capitalism. In the prevailing ahistorical mainstream narrative, public housing <coughs> is simply a failed social policy. But as historian Edward Goetz says, the story of American public housing is one of quiet successes drowned out by a few loud failures. And as the great writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie reminds us, when we reject the single story, when we realize that there is never a single story about any place or person, we regain a kind of paradise. Initially a program under the Public Works Administration, public housing was formally established in the first National Housing Act of 1937 that gave federal loans to state and local authorities to subsidize housing for millions of Americans devastated by the Great Depression. 
It was understood, expected, and a proud and important part of the U.S. government's mandate to provide, quote, a decent home and suitable living environment for every American family, the exact words of the Housing Act. And in the beginning, public housing was for all, but even then, explicit government policies at the local, state, and federal levels worked to ensure the segregation of African Americans from whites. And eventually, policies like redlining, blockbusting, racially exclusionary mortgage policies, and inequities and injustices around education, health, labor, and policing all contributed to the creation of an almost exclusive African American population in public housing in urban areas, including in Chicago. Scholars like Richard Rothstein, Rhonda Williams, Roberta Feldman's A Dignity of Resistance, or Akira Drake Rodriguez's Divergent Spaces for Deviance, among many others, have provided counter narratives and analysis for us to understand the differences between the resilience and resistance of the people of public housing from the systems of racial and economic injustice that informed failed policies. It is important to emphasize that while the museum's efforts are informed by an interdisciplinary group of advisors, consisting of some of the nation's foremost scholars, brilliant theorists who have participated in NEH planning grants and served as both formal and informal sort of whisperers to us for the exhibits, there has been a long-standing effort and foundational commitment to recognize the deep wellspring of knowledge, the experience, the expertise of public housing residents themselves. That is why when we started, we began our work not with artifacts and in archives, but in the tradition of people like Ida B. Wells Barnett, Studs Terkel, and Dr. Timuel Black, utilizing the methodologies of oral history, recording and preserving the histories of so-called ordinary people whose stories have been excluded from the mainstream historical narratives. Keeping public housing residents in the center of our organization has always been the moral compass for the National Public Housing Museum. During the 1970s, the disability rights movement adopted the slogan, nothing about us without us, to communicate that no policy should be decided without the full and direct participation of the groups affected by that policy. This philosophy informs our work and our institution at every turn. Currently, National Public Housing Museum is building the largest community-based archive of public housing stories. The second floor of the museum will have a recording studio named after Dr. Timbo Black, who served as an instructor in the program. And there he is, kind of in the picture at age 98. Um, he just recently passed last year. And we not only gather and preserve oral histories, but also educate the next generation of oral historians, hiring the graduates to work in our oral history core. We worked with the marvelous E. Viewing to develop the curriculum, and our oral history manager, Liu Chen, manages an oral history academy that recruits public housing residents from across the country and educates them in the ethics of oral history, interviewing and media skills, and provides students with recording kits. When they graduate, we hire them. Our oral history training program is named after Beauty Turner a resident of Robert Taylor Homes, who led what she called ghetto bus tours of the project so that people could hear directly from the residents. For beauty, the ghetto stood for greatest history ever told to our people. The P is silent, but the people are not. <laughs> The archives and national one and oral histories travel around the, the oral historians travel around the country, both in person and via Zoom, to listen and record stories. Listening, really listening to the oral histories, we also heard fascinating stories about ventures like this, for example, food cooperative that was started in Alka Gardens, a housing project on the south side of Chicago, which by 1949 returned several hundred thousand of dollars to customers and stockholders. With income of over $750,000, 7.7 million in today's dollars, it was the largest cooperative store in the United States, competing with the prices of nearby corporate chains and boasting 27 employees with union scale wages. We heard business people like Liz Thompson, who lived in Cabrini Green, talk about other forms of entrepreneurship as well in Cabrini. Actually, there were two primary forms of entrepreneurship in my part of Cabrini Green. There was the candy truck or candy store and someone's beauty salon in their kitchen. Of course, the candy store was the most fun, and for us, it was a truck 
an old hollowed out truck. There were multiple candy trucks in the neighborhood. None were mobile, let me be clear. And they built homemade shelves along the sides of the truck. And they put little boxes of candy on the sides of the truck. And so you would step up into the candy truck. Kids, you know, would take their nickel and go down and buy five pieces of candy from the candy truck. I mean, the truck was maybe four feet by five feet. And so you would huddle down a little bit and you just point it. I want one of those and one of those and one of those. Oh man, they had bubble gum. And remember the little dots that would come on long sheets of paper and the candy necklaces that you could wear around your neck and eat off a piece and you know, get mosquito bites because of sugar and all that. I don't remember many of us being able to afford candy bars, but they would have candy bars. Candy businesses were strong forms of entrepreneurship. And then, of course, the Kitchen Beauty Salon. In our neighborhood, it was Miss Gertrude who did all the hair. So for Easter, for Christmas, you had to make appointments pretty far in advance. Uh, you would sit at her kitchen table and you would watch this hot comb come from the fire closer and closer to your head. And before you knew it, you were walking out with a head full of curls and beautiful, ready for Easter Sunday. When the housing authority wanted to close the laundromat at Wentworth Gardens, Hallie Amy led a group of women to run a cooperative laundromat whose profits were reinvested to support a Girl Scout troop and senior citizen activities. We also found evidence of a gas cooperative. I don't really know exactly how that works, and also a lot of farming cooperatives. Um, inspired by these stories of economic development that benefited not just individuals, but also the communities, and also a recognition that the underground economy not only isolated people from the broader economy, which limited how much people could make, the museum started working with public housing residents to develop an entrepreneurship hub that draws from the history of solidarity economies. It will leverage the cultural capital of the museum and nurture and grow the social and economic capital of low and very low income people by opening a museum store that is a worker-owned cooperative that provides essential business skills and income to public housing residents. And so you can sort of see what you've done some work with um, artists, with public housing youth, who they develop our t-shirts and our tote bags, and then they also sell them. We distribute all of the profits, and they now run a corner store co-op, which is online, which will also be in the museum. But the core part of the museum experience for visitors will be three restored <coughs> apartments that provide an intimate way to understand the impact of large national policies and historic events, but through the eyes and experiences of families from the 30s and 40s, the 50s and the early 60s, and then the 60s through the 80s. These apartments will be more than a particular physical space and place or a collection of objects but also serve as a call to build a more capacious foundation for our nation's shared histories and a place for stories that bear witness to an American history that is both brilliantly ambitious and also deeply troubled. Crystal Palmer, one of our board members, says that we must tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. And Francine Washington, another one of our board members, says our mission should be telling the stories of our in-laws and our outlaws. The first apartment will be a restored apartment of Inez Turovitz, a Jewish resident who described public housing as the first place where she had her first truly kosher kitchen, never uh, untouched by pork. She met her husband, who also lived in the Jane Addams homes, and their son, Jack, is now on our board. This apartment will be restored from photos of their apartment, but also through conversations with the descendants and the sort of collecting of artifacts, and also tell the history of um, Maxwell Street and the Jewish families who live there <coughs> and the immigrants um, who were in that area. We will not only recreate the Torah of that story, but by ex extension, tell the stories of many other Jewish families in Jane Addams homes. Some of them found a home in public housing in the 1940s, fleeing the Holocaust. In the early oral histories, um, and just one more thing, I'll just sort of say that for museum people, we also, we work with Jack, who's on our board, and he has the family gefilte fish bowl, and so he's loaning it to the museum, but only when it's not a Jewish holiday, because then he wants it back. So we've developed kind of new loan policies so that objects can come in and out of the museum and sort of be used when they need to be used. 
Um, I also just wanted to share one of the other um, sweet artifacts to show how personal stories can lead to larger national stories. So um, Jack, the young Jack, loved Superman above everything. And um, they talked about his love of Superman in uh, the oral history so much. And so we went and sort of found the early Superman comics. And in one of the first times when Superman appears in action comics, he's here and he sort of says, you know, he goes to save three young juvenile delinquents. And he says, it's not entirely your fault that you're delinquent. It's these slums, your poor living conditions. If there was only some way that we could remedy that. And so he actually goes and knocks down the slums, forcing the government to build um, public housing. And so you can kind of sort of see that this was actually the zeitgeist of the moment. And so the apartment, you'll actually you know, be able to learn all about not just Jack's stories, but also sort of larger national stories. Um, in the second apartment, uh, we'll actually invite visitors to confront the consequences of intentional decades-long governmental policies and systems of racism and institutionalized segregation that contributed to cycles of poverty. Policies including redlining, a system that promoted enforced residential segregation, seen here in the homeowner loans corporation maps, but also visitors will learn about the GI Bill, one of the biggest surges in bank mortgages for home ownership, but which only really allowed some families to move out of the J-9 homes, but not all. Black veterans weren't able to make use of the housing provisions of the GI Bill. And so in this apartment, though, we decided to deploy the work of artists over artifacts. An essay that I return to over and again is one by Jules Brown, The Truth of Material Culture where he argues for the blurring of the boundaries between art and artifacts. Crown describes how history consistently uses small truths to build large untruths. Facts, however, cannot retrieve the totality of human experience and the rich complexity of affect, emotions, and sensations. On the other hand, fiction and poetry often begin with artifice but end up telling us profound truths regarding the human condition. Deploying artists, poets, and fictions to tell deeper truths is a powerful tool. And while museums and historic sites, like the National Public Housing Museum, are a place to encounter the past, as I've been arguing, they must be windows through which to unleash the radical imaginations of the visitors. Their instructive and educational value lies not only the simple storehousing of objects, but also the opportunity to do other kinds of work and to make people feel other kinds of things. And that is what I think the power of art is. This is not to suggest that the realm of facts is not important or ineffectual. Instead, it is a convincing argument that most of us do not make sense of our lives simply through uncontested forensic truths. For this reason, we've decided to artfully tell the story with the help of Manuel Cinema, who recently worked with Nia DaCosta on the trailer for the remake of Candyman. They will work with Dr. Kimba Yamada-Taylor, a recent MacArthur Genius Prize winner, the author of Race for Profit, to introduce visitors to three different families who lived in the Jane Addams homes at the same time, but experienced public housing in very similar, um, but also different ways. And I'm not gonna, for time, I'm not gonna play, but if you get a chance to look at Manuel Cinema's work, it's gonna be, it's really, really beautiful, and they've developed a really great six-minute experience for visitors as they come through the second apartment. Oh, it's so creepy, I'll just show a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna stand up. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, it's very creepy, you'll be thinking of that music the whole night. <laughs> the third apartment will focus on the 60s and the 80s and will feature a full-scale restoration of the Hatch family apartment. In a past study by the National Historic Trust, it is noted that there are more historic houses than McDonald's, Burger King's, and Pizza, Pizza Hut's combined in our country. But of these houses, only 0.01% of them are historic sites that tell the stories of people of color or women. We are proud that the museum is an official African-American historic site committed to interpreting African-American history that is part of all of our history. One of my favorite stories the family told us in the oral histories is this one. Helen Holmes Jackson refused to buy a television set for her nine children, but she was happy to supply them with world book encyclopedias. Helen and her husband, Reverend Marshall Hatch, wanted their children to read great books, not watch Bonanza. 
But in 1966, when Martin Luther King moved to Hamlin Street to organize for fair housing, their mother decided she wanted her children to see King and bought the family's first television set. We were allowed to stay up and watch all the news stories about Dr. King and Coretta Scott King, and that is all we thought was on television for a long while. The oldest sister wrote a sentence on a recording. We thought TV was MLK TV. When you visit the Hatch family apartment, you will learn the story about Helen and her family, but also learn about other historic movements and people through the eyes and the lens of the Hatch family stories. This includes not only stories about um, Martin Luther King and his work in Chicago <coughs> that will be sort of told on the television, but also their experiences watching you know, Muhammad Ali fights, their sort of work within the community. Um, and this is the kind of pushback that King received uh, in Chicago while he was fighting. Uh, it was quite a violent uh, experience for him. But also in the apartments, you'll also sort of see, you know, in the kitchen, you'll see a picture of Reverend Marshall Hatch in his sixth grade, his third uh, grade uh, birthday party. And we noticed as we were looking at all of these um, pictures that there were so many images of kind of this nasty green paint that people also talked so much about in their oral history. And when we realized we started to do sort of store, like hunt about the green paint and you know looking at the green paint in our um, building itself, um, and then doing research and learning about the sort of younger Barack Obama when he was um, organizing the Hazel Johnson and Alt Guild, who's, who's considered the mother of environmental mm -hmm. justice, and realized that there was also like a story about lead paint and public housing that could be told in the kitchen. And so there's a kind of way where we're always starting with the individual intimate story, but then opening up as gently and urgently as possible to other issues like environmental justice stories that we should be in thinking about and talking about. The Hatch Family Tour is also going to be narrated by Darrell Harry, who is a prominent comedian, and it was also a very intentional decision to include humor <coughs> infused with social political com commentary when we're talking about issues of race and class. And he's writing, um, Nate Marshall, the poet, is writing the tour. Um, and it's, going, it's really funny, but also sad. And it brings in a lot of different affects for the visitor who will experience it. Um, the other thing is that in the Hatch family, uh, they had two birds, two finches, called Martin and Luther. And uh, we decided that we were actually going to have two live birds in the apartment. So we now are also a zoo, because if you have birds, then you have to actually apply to become recognized as a zoo. Um, and then also we started working with Marisa Moran John, who is an artist, because she loved the birds so much. And so we've been doing um, focus groups with young people, and uh, she's been drawing sort of these birds, and we realized that Throughout the museum now, Martin Luther will be kind of guides for young people as they go through the museum. One of them will be more skeptical, <laughs> you know, like one of them will be like, what's a low income tax credit? You know, things like that. And they will help to explain things and um, all throughout the space. Um, so for us, the other really important thing is that um, the last space that visitors will experience is called Demand Impossible. Possible. And it's actually an activist space that will be filled with advocacy, tables, places for you to not just like learn things and feel things, but also an invitation to do things. And that one will be curated and changing and we'll have stories about land trust and whatever actions, like right now Illinois is going through an, a just eviction um, campaign. And so it'll be a space to get involved in those campaigns. Um, and here's some images of other kind of um, campaigns that we worked with in the past with a program that we have called Artists as Instigator. And this is a really important project because it links the arts and culture with public policy through our theory of change, which is that if you tell stories, which is giving accounts, it is linked etymologically to this notion of calling people into account for civic responsibility 
which is then in turn linked to the keeping of accounts, which is a form of reparation and repair. And so kind of in this circle, our, Paul, our sort of theory of change is storytelling needs to be linked to civic accountability, moral accountability, and reparations work. And so we've done a bunch of these different projects, um, and it was, we did the Just Housing Initiative with William, um, and it actually was successful, and it helped pass uh, legislation that made it illegal to discriminate against people who were formerly incarcerated in housing. And then more recently, we worked with Tanika Lewis Johnson on her project, um, which was called Inequity for Sale, where she looked at the history of unjust land sale contracts, and we created monuments and memorials with Tanika. We did a, a podcast with her, and it, all throughout um, Chicago at these places of homes that were taken through unjust land sale contracts, there's these new monuments and memorials there. And so we have this program now that's funded by the Mellon Foundation, and we just had a new artist of this year that we're about to announce in a couple of days. Um, and the thing that's really important for me is to say that cultural change always precedes political change. Um, this is something that Jeff Chang, the hip hop scholar, has said, and I really deeply believe that every moment of major social change requires a collective belief of imagination. That you can't have political transformation um, unless there actually is an explosion of mass creativity. And so sometimes when we were opening the public housing museum, people would say, oh, shouldn't you just create housing instead of trying to have a museum? And I actually believe that, yes, people should also be creating more housing, but that you have to knock on every single window in order for these things, for social change to happen. And if you look at the history of social transformation, artists, architects, like people who've been reimagining space in the way that we relate to one another, they've always been a core of all of those social movements. And it's really sort of like we refuse to like give and sort of say that like, oh, this is kind of an extra thing that we could or should be doing, but really believe that it's core in the fight for housing and security, to address housing and security. Um, all throughout the museum, there's kind of additional spaces where like DJ Spinderella is our guest curator and there's a music room working with Josh Kuhn, who's a music scholar. Um, we're really exploring the soundtrack of um, America and what is what the communities that have been marginalized have been forced to do like through their cultural productivity. The lyrics and the songs and um, there's a really beautiful music room that also has a dance floor for dancing um, and we've been collecting stories of people who lived in public housing in that space. And we recently did a really big concert in Millennium Park for 4,000 people and we're also going to be doing now instead of large scale con concerts like Tiny Desk we're going to have small concerts in the entrepreneurship hub in the museum store, um, and Lupe Fiasco will be the first person. His grandmother lived in uh, the Jane Addams homes. And all throughout the museum, uh, there's going to be a real commitment to public art because of you know what I was saying to you earlier. I really think it's important. And art was always part of the built environment of successful housing complexes. <coughs> And so in our complex, it was these Edgar Miller statues that existed, and um, he was a sort of maverick artist who did these sculptures as part of the WPA, and we have restored them, um, and they used to look like this, and now they look like this, yay! <laughs> and they'll be put back in the space. Um, we had a national competition, and uh, Amanda Williams and Olalek and Jayafus were chosen, and uh, Amanda, as many of you may know, she does sort of the color of black life and has been also, she had for a long time painted houses that had been um, designated for destruction in Chicago. And she sort of looked at our paint chips that we had collected and made a beautiful collection of those for us. And so we have a color palette which is used in all of our wayfinding. And it's an entrance that I think is really beautiful that points to both joy and style as an act of resistance, but also the diaspora of public housing residents. And we also have a new monument memorial where for our land acknowledgement, we're working with Andrew Carlson, um, and also uh, an exhibit that will look at how to interweave respectfully and with solidarity the stories of Jisabal and also African Americans who've displaced from our site with indigenous people. And we also just won the Joyce Award, and so Marissa is also creating a basketball court in our parking lot 
that will be a sort of space to look at the history of midnight basketball, which was really important for um, uh, community organizing and activism, and also a little bit problematic. And so we're excited about that. Um, I'm going to tell you about two more things. It's called History Lessons. <laughs> And this was from a conversation that I had with Brian Stevenson from Equal Justice Initiative. And he really said, like, hey, listen, we've made huge leaps and bounds in telling stories of exceptionalism for people of color and for women and other marginalized groups, and also stories of tragedy. But the everyday, the vernacular, those are the spaces which are still so much within the grasp of white supremacy. And so if you could just commit a space to tell everyday stories of people who are poor, people who are black, people who are women, like that would be a really good sort of advance in historic sites. Like it doesn't have to be a tragedy, it doesn't have to be somebody's really famous. And so we tried a kind of project where we asked public housing residents, you know, what are some objects that you would put in a museum that helps to tell your story. And it's not special objects, it's kind of everyday objects. And then we put them in writing workshops um, and they started writing their labels. Like we took them to the Art Institute and the Museum of Contemporary Art and they were like, these labels are trash. I mean, why do you have to like, you know, I don't love learning anything from it. And so they started writing their own labels that are so beautiful um, that really tell the history of public housing. And this is a, really big project for us that now is the largest gallery in the museum and it's rotating so it starts with Chicago and um, New York and Houston and we just um, collect an object from for example George Floyd's sister um, about George Floyd who grew up in Cooney homes and it was a really successful small project um, and we got a very big grant from the NEH to make it this kind of part of America's, you know, more perfect union celebration. And I'm really excited about it. And the objects and the stories and the labels are just so beautiful there. Um, and the last, last thing I promised I'm going to tell you about is because it is, this is like architecture and stuff, there is, it is a preservation project. And so, you know, we had to like match the Chicago common brick, which was not fun at all. Um, and early on when we were sort of doing this work, we walked through the building with Dora Appel. And um, she's a really fantastic scholar who works on poverty porn, or so-called poverty <coughs> porn. And as we walk through the spaces of crumbling walls and like sort of peeling paint and remnants, um, Dora asked us to dig deep into why so many people, when they were walking through these places and touring it, would say, oh my gosh, this is so terrifyingly beautiful. You should just leave it just like this. Like this would be so important for people to see. And she said, like, wait a minute. And she shared her research from her book, Beautiful and Terrible Ruins, Detroit and the Anxiety of Decline, which traces the historical, cultural, and political roots of the visual culture of trauma and the significance of aesthetics sometimes called ruin porn. Appel links the Western fascination with ruins to 18th century romantic notions of the sublime, a sensation of the terror of nature experienced at a safe remove. She described how preserving the ruins of the building as is could have a similar effect on visitors. Public housing's decline and destruction might be experienced then as a result of a horrible natural event instead of an intentional social policy and a decades of systemic racism. This could obscure the stories of joy, of resilience, and of community that National Public Housing Museum hoped to share. And she explained how ruined aesthetics leaves viewers with the assurance of being safe from drug effects rather than an understanding of not just empathy, but maybe also of complicity. And Appel really troubles the romantic and cultural work that ruined imagery performs. And she writes like in her really great book, the romantic narrative of the beauty of decay in the ruined image produces pleasure by containing and controlling the anxiety of decline through the safety and distance of representation. This is the cultural function of ruined imagery. The mental mastery of the terrifying is its nature and purpose, even as it makes evident the disastrous effects of capitalism. The more aesthetically refined and pleasing the ruin, the more effective the distancing. 
So for us, we had all these like sort of ruined spaces and we had sort of preserved all like the ruined medicine cabinets, graffiti walls and things like that. So we had to figure out if we were gonna just destroy them and not show them or how would we actually show them. So just in the last six months, we've developed an exhibit strategy called If You Care to Look. And if you care to look, actually are sort of strategically placed interventions throughout the museum of the salvaged objects, medicine cabinets, bathtubs, intercoms, radiators, and all these things. They all have stories to tell, and they ask viewers to look more closely and to sort of look through the immediate aesthetic effect. And you can sort of see, like, you know, there's a beautiful ruined yellow ceiling, and we've kind of replaced it in the sort of entryway, but with like a new yellow ceiling. And, you know, sort of doors and other places are sort of all um, displayed with this if you care to look methodology. And they'll have labels like this, like, for example, the radiator will tell the story of Project Heat and how ever since official weather records began in 1873, the average temperature was really low. Apartments inside the Jane Addams homes were always hot. It'll talk about the on-site heating plants, but then also the fact that, you know, heat was provided um, by residents as a right. But then in the prelude to demolition during the plan for transformation, they stopped subsidized heating, asking residents to actually have more control over their own living environment, which meant that they had to actually pay their own bills. And that first winter, then people started dying from freezing. And so there's a kind of beautiful and terrible story that we're asking people to like look at as they look at these and to grapple with the kind of social history as we move forward. All right, so I'm just gonna end by saying that like this work, is the responsibility of the state actually but we're also doing this work to create a kind of public sphere worthy of its name we're even though we're called a public housing museum we always say that we're not so much about housing as we are about the history of the public and our commitment to a commonwealth and things which should stay in the common good in order for us to actually have a life and worth life that's worth living together with one another. So I'll just stop there and say thank you so much for listening to me. Hi, thanks so much. Hello, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Does anybody have questions? We can start with that. Okay, then I can go. Um, so this is, um, uh, this question is from uh, Matthew, uh, uh, and uh, he's a senior in the landscape architecture and also Meyer, um, rationalist in landscape, and also Stephen, um, he's a PhD student in architecture. Uh, so this question is about creatorship. I think you talked a lot about the creatorship and like, the object uh, towards the end of the, the lecture today. And your work or your practice as a director or curator at the National Public Housing Museum is to, you know, like salvage the objects of history um, that are often forgotten, ignored, and even erased from the public to tell that the unintended or undramatic and its everydayness can also compose a history. Um, but also, um, curating also entails a certain intention and a strategic dramatization. So how do you acquire these objects in the first place and select someone as the like, representative of unintended every day? So that's the question, I guess. And how do you try not to do curation? Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, people probably heard. It's also it's it's, not, it's a little bit hard to hear because of the like okay, sound sorry. clear. But I got the question, and thanks for it. Thanks for doing this. Um, and thanks everyone for staying. <laughs> sorry, I sort of went on a little too long. But um, everybody probably knows like the etymology of curation, right? Is like about caring for things and sort of this idea of you know what does it mean to approach an object with radical care. And for me, in the museum field, I think the biggest important thing that we can do is how do you activate an object so that it activates subjectivity? So we're sort of making that distinction between the subject and object sort of divide. And for us, it's not about um, expertise, professionalism, or like a PhD. 
It's mm -hmm. about like this sort of, like I said, recognizing organic intellectuals. The sort of owner of the object is perhaps the person who has the most to say about what it is. And so, so much of my job in life is about relationship building and hanging out with people, being in solidarity with their lives and what's happening in order to actually, you know, really get an object. So like, for example, um, Marion Stamps, who is one of the legendary leaders of Cabrini Green, her daughter, Tara Stamps, worked with us to write a label, and her mother, who was often dressed in African garb, but she actually just did that to like intimidate politicians and Mayor Daly. She actually <laughs> loved her like, motorcycle jacket and stuff like that, and so they donated her motorcycle jacket. But when um, Tara got into a fight with her sister, then, you know, Cho actually got the motorcycle jacket, and so then I had to, like, build a relationship and navigate a sister's, like, argument, and then mediate them, bring them together for dinner, and talk about, like, why it was important to actually get this, you know, motorcycle jacket. And so the kind of toolbox that I have as a curator is not something that I necessarily learned in an art history book, but it's more like, oh, like how can you actually truly build trust and friendship with people and understand what they're living through and what they're going through so that ultimately it was kind of me baking a cake, bringing them together, having this conversation, which allowed us to sort of have that particular object, you know? And so it's a lot of the work that I think is the kind of 21st century um, sort of work of cur curatorial um, sort of ethics, especially because we realized that in the past, so many museums, most precious objects, were actually pillaged from like imperialism and mm -hmm. other, you know, racist practices. And so there's a kind of way where what does it mean to a museum to have a collection and to say these objects are important? And like, what is actually important in the world? Like holding onto a pillaged object that belongs in a different place, or like actually having objects that help to tell us history and a story that help us all create a better world. I hope that answered your question, and Matthew. Um, does anybody else have questions? Uh, sure. Um, I guess. Well, thank you. So much. That, there, there was so much in there that was a lot of it like super impactful, and I'm very grateful for you to sort of just like almost like data dumping on us. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, I only gave you a small portion of what's yeah, in the museum. <laughs> so this is amazing. Um, I do also I, I want to thank you for sort of like the the like the centering of of, of radical resistance and like truth telling. Um, I think my question is, is um, I'm curious how you think about um, the, 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 the role that architects have in creating these social harms. And, you know, I think, if, like, in a school like this, we think a lot about how architects can change the world for the better, but we don't spend too much time dwelling on, like, our complicity in injustices, either through neglect or through carelessness. And I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah. Thanks so much. I mean, I don't know why I didn't tell you about the space sort of dedicated to architecture, which is kind of like this cookie afterthought. And maybe why I didn't is because when we first started, um, Roberta Feldman, Garfield Perth, like a bunch of different architects were very core to our work. And you maybe know also that sometimes people blame the failure of public housing on the architecture of public housing you know, sort of high rises. There's a big debate about that. But of course, you know, really wealthy people live in high rises all the time. That's not a problem. And then they continue to live in, you know, like high rises. So is there something fundamentally wrong with that particular architecture? You know, or is it something else? And so we brought together a core group of architects to like really talk about it. Um, and they actually said, please do not create a special exhibition that is just about architects and architecture. What really is socially responsible is to put the architects within the framework of all the other things that are happening. Architects in conversation with residents, architects with public policy, architects, you know, in sort of like what is the acts of resistance and acts of complicity. So it wouldn't just be like focused on architects. So what we did is there's a gallery in the museum. It's called Case Studies for Truly Public Housing. 
and it's working with a guest curator who is um, in public policy and architecture at Harvard, um, Suzanne um, Schindler, and uh, she is curating a show which is about the other CHA, which is the Cambridge Housing Authority, and it puts architects but an architecture, but in relationship to a whole bunch of other things too. So the built environment with resident stories and how they react. And so I think I started this thinking, ooh, there should be a special section that is both a call out and a call in to architects. And they actually responded and said, we don't want a special section. We want to be in all of the different sections, you know, so wherever it is. So in so many, even of the history lessons, um, sort of objects, people's stories, they talk about the built environment and how they interacted with the architecture of the space and sort of why um, the sort of um, particular story about like a watering hose that a woman from Lathrop Holmes donated is really about sort of the landscaping and the gardening and everything that was happening, you know? And so it's not a special section which says landscape, it's very important for a healthy environment, but it's woven into the rest of the story of um, the museum. Yeah. So I mean, I think I hope that answered your questions. It's just it's kind of roundabout to say that I think the museum started for the first couple of years thinking that there was going to be a whole section about architecture, and as we started working with architects and the residents, we realized that sort of isolating that story was sort of part of the problem and that actually architects and the story and the history of architecture and public housing needed to be really woven into everything else that was happening. Like you can't talk about the architecture of Cabrini Green without talking about the policing of Cabrini Green and the surveillance, you know, and so to separate architecture from the story of policing was, was going to be a mistake. Yeah. Anyone else? Please. There's a quick question. Maybe the end of your talk it was really wonderful. Um, I like the name of this, the National Public Housing Museum, even though it's like Stomp City Chicago. I wonder if you, uh, through the exhibits or through the other work, kind of think about international public housing and the relationship of what's happening here in the US and the dearth of public housing funding versus what may be happening in other, other places. Yeah, I mean, you know, the United States is the quote unquote, like the most developed country with the least amount of social or public housing, right? Like we have the lowest amount of money spent and also lowest amount of units from like any other industrialized, you know, sort of developed um, nation. And so, and also Catherine Barrow Worcester and other people who really pushed and fought for public housing in the United States. Like we wouldn't have public housing if it wasn't for a young generation, I think, of women, because there's a very gendered story to people who would de really politicize the sort of domestic space because they understood that sort of divide of public and private. So Catherine Barrow Worcester, you know, traveled to Europe and like learned what was happening in social housing over there and then came back and then helped to write the National Housing Act of 1937. So there are sort of spaces that tell individual stories that also help us understand how U.S. public housing is not just U.S. public housing. There is also a gallery on the second floor of the museum, which is dedicated to rotating exhibits that one of them, which will be a contemporary art exhibit, one of them will have a guest curator that compares and contrasts sort of international sort of housing, what's happening in India, for example, other places where there's really interesting developments in housing. And also like grappling with the distinctions between public and social housing and affordable housing. Like right now, we have these divides that get, I think, further um, dug in through movement organizing that is very siloed. Like if you go to a meeting for people who are fighting um, against um, homelessness and talking to houseless people, it's a totally different group than people who are at affordable housing meetings. They're totally different than public housing resident meetings. Like, how could this be? And it's kind of the really fracturing of the movement for us to be fighting for housing as a human right. And sort of the museum hopes to like bring those groups together and also do a lot of, I mean, not shaming, because that's a terrible affect, but ultimately most stories that when you look at like Europe or other places, it's like, wow, there's so many places that are doing it better. And I think that kind of breaking down of US exceptionalism is really important. 
So, and we're so new in this kind of work also. Like most museums have, you know, tracked out their exhibits for two or three years. And I'm trying, when I was at the Hull House, we tried to preserve a kind of guerrilla programming because if we want it to be relevant, you have to like talk about what's happening now. Like we're about to have a tent refugee, basically, um, sort of city that's set up outside of Chicago because of the 10,000 new migrants, 2,500 of them who are sleeping on police floors. And if you program out three years, like how can you possibly be relevant and bring people together to talk about things, you know, to convene and stuff like that. So we're trying to build in that kind of nimble you know, sort of ability to respond to actions and to also do quick exhibits. It's just like how academic publishing sometimes was like ridiculous where you like write a book and it comes out three and a half or four years later, right? And so like there's new ways of publishing that can address that. And so I think exhibits also need to adapt in that way where you can actually create, you know, pop-up exhibits, do exhibits that are responding and bring people together. And so that second floor space is gonna have, you know, one contemporary art show that will be very programmed and sort of, you know, for years in advance, and then the rest of the shows will really be up for, we'll put calls for proposals, and people can do things in that space, and we hope they will be international, we'll hope there'll be people responding to what's happening on the ground right now. Okay. So, on the note of the like, novel practices, like new practices, and in a way to engage with people, um, so we read like about five articles plus like more, but, um, and then um, could you talk a little bit about the three labels for the history, uh, uh, the portrait of Jane Addams and how the history of her sexuality, um, yeah. because we have, we had a lot of questions about that and oh, okay. I, if you could talk a little bit about that and um, about kind of the multiple, the idea of multiple and multiple reality and how the, the idea of the multiple uh, kind of contribute to the construction of the social truth as opposed to forensic truth um, and yeah, the public, the you know, construction of public perception. Cool, yeah, so labels are traditionally the way where museums sort of really put the so-called forensic truth mm -hmm. and it's like that's their contribution, that kind of omniscient voice. But the root of labels in museums is really quite radical in the sort of British museum had said, you have to have labels because at that time, only rich people could buy the catalog mm -hmm. for the exhibition. And so if you couldn't afford the catalog, you didn't know what you were seeing. And so the House of Commons said you had to actually have labels. But now in museums, the kind of so-called tombstone label that you see in most things, it's like what we always said, it's like where joy goes to die. It's kind of just like, you know, yeah. it's a painting, 14 by 18, blah, 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 or something like that. Like that's the tombstone part of it. And so, when I got to the Hull House, there was a really beautiful painting of Mary Rose Smith, and it hung sort of hidden away. And I was like, why don't we actually display this? It's like one of the best artifacts. And people were like, well, we don't know what to say about it on the label because there's so much debate. Like, was she Jane Addams' business partner? Was she her lesbian lover? Was she her best friend? And we can't write a label for it, so we can't show the object. And I was like, that's bonkers, you know? And so we actually brought the um, painting downstairs and instead we talked to many different experts, quote unquote, including family members, Jane Adams' family, who were like, she was not gay, and Mary Rose's family, who was like, oh, our auntie was totally gay, and she was Jane Adams' bestie, you know? <laughs> and so it was like we had all the different sort of labels out of like what people would say, including sort of art historians who were like, you don't have to talk about um, whether she was gay or not. Like, you just talk about what this painting was. Like, Jane Adams loved this painting above all objects. She, when she traveled, she would bring this painting with her and hung across her bed. This was her most favorite object. And we're like, oh, okay, like, that's also an interesting way of telling history, like art historically through like what this painting was and, what, and how it was painted. And so we opened up that exhibit with the multiple labels and we also asked the public. And that was kind of like the first thing that I did in the first week that I was at the Hull House Museum. And you know, the newspapers then were like, oh my gosh, Jane Addams has been outed, and you know, things like that. And it was a really beautiful exhibit that brought in so many people's responses. And I was so shocked at like the museum field was like, how dare you open it up to the public? Like that's actually our work, you know? And so I realized that what was 
it, at issue was really like who gets to talk about history and like what is this public space that museums can actually mediate. So, and then what happened later on was I stopped that exhibit because um, Monticello, Jefferson's museum, heard about it and they were like, oh my gosh, this is great because we don't know how to talk about Sally Hemings. So we're just going to have all sorts of people say, who do you think Sally Hemings was? We don't know who Sally Hemings was. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is not good. You, like that is not a good use of that methodology because we know who Sally Hemings was. And so we sort of changed that and iterated again. Oh, I see. Um, and the sort of four truths that you reference mm -hmm. is something that I carry with me for like all of my work. Um, and maybe that's like the last thing because then people can go eat dinner <laughs> so I that enough. and I love the four truths. So the four truths is from um, South African Truth and Reconciliation and it's how they define truth. And it was the first truth, which is very important, which is forensic. And forensic truth is stuff which really cannot and should not be denied. Like Sally Hemings was an enslaved person, right? Or this person's arm was blown off, right? But then there's also what they called um, narrative truth, which is the individual truth and the stories that we tell ourselves that is very different. Like one person's version might be different than another person's. But then there also needs to be dialogic truth which is when those two different narrative truths are brought together. Oh, okay. And when I was at um, Hall House, like in my second month, somebody came and said, oh my gosh, I love this place so much. Every year I come here and do a pilgrimage. Um, I met Jane Adams, and I was like, oh my gosh, I was the first person that I met. And she was like, this, you know, I can't remember forget, it was 1942. I came in, it was sunny, and she gave me a book, and all these kinds of things. And when she left, I was like, oh my gosh, I met somebody. And then someone was like, that's so weird, because Jane Adams died in 1938. Like, how could it have been 1942, you know? But it was like, that was her narrative truth. And like, what was I supposed to do as a museum? Like, excuse me, ma'am, you're wrong. It was not 1942, you know? So there's a kind of way where you have to create space for dialogic truth to coexist and then there's in South Africa they define something which they said is the most important truth and that's the truth that government states and civic and cultural institutions are responsible for and that's restorative truth and that's the truth that brings all of those truths together and then creates a world where we can all live and so there's a kind of way where as a history museum especially in 21st century if your job is just to tell the facts of history like, good luck. I mean, there's the internet and Wikipedia and all these things, you know. You have to be doing different kinds of work and bringing people together in different kinds of way. And for us, that kind of restorative truth is where we sort of see our call to action. Well, I have so many more, like, follow-up questions to that, but I guess with this, I guess we will end yeah. we'll conclude we'll the lecture. Yeah, <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. So thank